we need to talk about the Midlands. How's it going, everybody? My name is Jesse, and welcome to my wrestling show, the place where we talk about the greatest sport in the world. And I want to dive right into the Midlands. But before I do that, please subscribe. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers, so I'd really appreciate your help with that. So let's talk about the Midlands. The Midlands has really kind of digressed over the past couple of years. I'm used to a Midlands where the four guys in the semifinals are ranked in the top 15. The wrestlers in the finals are both in the top 10, where it's a super deep field and we get a lot of high-level matchups. And we just really didn't get that this year. There was a few of those, but it was a little bit watered down. And there's two things to talk about that may be causing some of the lack of depth that we have traditionally seen at the Midlands. The first is the Soldier Salute. So Iowa started their own tournament that takes place on the same days as the Midlands. And Iowa traditionally has gone and wrestled at the Midlands. And obviously they're one of the best teams in the country. So if they don't go to that tournament, you're losing a lot of top talent in those weight classes and so the field's not going to be as deep the other thing that kind of made this midlands tournament a little bit weaker is a few of the top guys and a few of the cool storylines that i was looking forward to pulled out the day before or the day of the tournament richie figueroa ridge lovett austin gomez pat glory they all dropped the day before or the day of the tournament which kind of pulled a lot of juice out of the field because at 149 pounds, we were going to have Austin Gomez, Ridge Lovett, Kyle Parco, and Yaya Thomas. And we lost two of those four guys the day of the tournament. Ridge Lovett, he had a good excuse. He got kind of caught up in the Southwest debacle. And I'm not going to judge any wrestler or coach for trying to make the best decision for their wrestlers. But the reality is, this is not good for wrestling, and it's not good for wrestling fans. Ultimately, we want fans to travel and attend these events live in person. We want fans to go to the Midlands, to go to the Southern Scuffle, to travel in, to pack these arenas for these events, and for fans to tune in and watch these on TV. And when the bracket changes so much the day of the tournament, you lose a lot of the fire and the ump that goes into these events. And plus, it's very difficult for the media to report and hype these events when they don't even know which wrestlers are competing. I know we're talking about Midlands, but I want to use the example of Southern Scuffle. Iowa State is scheduled to wrestle at the Southern Scuffle. It has been on their schedule. But Kevin Dresser announced the other day that Casey Swiderski, Panero Johnson... David Carr, Marcus Coleman, Younger Bastida, none of those guys are going to compete at the Southern Scuffle. Now, again, I'm not judging him for trying to do what's best for his wrestlers, but it makes it really difficult on fans to travel these events. If I'm an Iowa State fan and I planned to go to the Southern Scuffle because I wanted to cheer on the Cyclones only to find out four days before our five best wrestlers aren't even gonna be there. When you're planning your trip, you're booking hotels, you're getting the car packed, and then you find out the five best wrestlers aren't competing, that's really gonna deflate your excitement to really attend these events in the future. We really need to get to a place where it's very clear who's wrestling, where they're wrestling, so fans, the media can get behind these events, and we're always gonna have people pull out to injury but it really needs to get to a point where that is the exception, not the rule. And we're kind of at the point where it's the rule where we really don't know who's wrestling, who's competing until the brackets drop that morning. And one thing that we need to do is we need to incentivize wrestlers to get quality wins. Willie Saylor posted on Twitter on his Matt Scouts account. He said, college wrestling, show us some love. Also college wrestling, we're not competing almost anywhere until you make us. And this was kind of in response to a lot of the wrestlers pulling out of the Midlands. Because we as college wrestling fans, we always complain, put us on ESPN, put us on the big networks, people will watch. We want people to love college wrestling, but then we don't back it up with a lot of top high level matches 
for people to watch. My response to this was simply, I think seating criteria needs to change. A lot more emphasis on strength of schedule and quality wins and less emphasis on win percentage. I would like to see us get to a point where a three seed or a two seed can have five losses, but they have seven wins over top 15 guys. And then the 13 seed may only have one loss, but they only have one win over the top 15 guys. This is the only way this changes. The only way this changes if it starts to affect seeding. That's how this changes. So we need to reward strength of schedule and quality wins. Guys that get five, six, seven, eight wins over top 10, top 15, top 20 guys, they need to be rewarded with really high seeds at the National Mid Tournament, regardless of if they took three or four losses along the way. So that's enough of me ranting about that aspect of the Midlands. I want to talk about the wrestling. There still were some pretty good matches there. I still watched as much wrestling as I possibly could over the course of two days. 125 pounds. Brandon Courtney and Richie Figueroa are still battling out who will be the starter. And it's still unsettled. Brandon Courtney made the finals at Midlands, but he really didn't get a marquee win. Remember, he got a medical forfeit over Killian Cardinal in the semifinals and then lost his finals match to Eric Barnett. He didn't really close the door on Richie Figueroa trying to take his spot. At the end of the season, I think they're going to have to go with Courtney. It's very difficult to not go with a national finalist, but Courtney did not close the door and solidify himself as the starter at this tournament. Quincy Monday of Princeton, he wrestled at 165 pounds instead of 157 pounds. And it looks like he's going to stay at 165. This probably means he's going to be at 165 for the remainder of the season. And he looked pretty good. He got a win over Dean Hamidi in the finals, who was Dean Hamidi was a All-American last year. And so Quincy Monday can obviously compete with these guys at 165 pounds. I expect he will stay there for the rest of the year. Now, 157 was already pretty wide open with Quincy Monday down at 157, but now that he's up at 165, 157 is even that much more wide open. At 184 pounds, pretty cool story here. Jarrett Shinholster of UW Whitewater, a D3 wrestler, a D3 university, made the finals at the Midlands. On his way to the finals, he beat Brian Soldano of Rutgers, a top 10 guy at 184 pounds. Now remember guys, D3 student athletes do not get scholarships. They're paying their own way to compete in these sports at Division Three. So I think it's pretty cool that a Division Three guy can compete with Division Two and even a top 10 guy in the Division One rankings. I watched him wrestle in his finals bout and he looked he looked the part. He looked tough. He did lose, but I was impressed with his ability to wrestle with these guys. So I just think that's a pretty cool story. Last thing I want to touch on, 285 pounds, Colton Schultz. He loses to true freshman from Pitt, Dayton Pitzer. From this result, there is one answer I think we get and one question I think we need to ask. The answer is Colton Schultz is human. He is not the dominant force that I thought he was, and maybe a lot of us thought he was at the beginning of the season. Now, he's still really, really good, but he's not a surefire finalist. He definitely has some vulnerabilities. But the loss to A.J. Nevels at the Cliff Keen Las Vegas tournament, and now this loss to Dayton Pritzer at Midlands, has me questioning these holes that he has. Can he solve them before the national tournament? And the question that we need to ask about Dayton Pitzer, true freshman, he's in, he's technically in his red shirt. Should Keith Gavin pull his red shirt? He beat two national qualifiers. 
He beat Trent Hilger, who's a previous All-American. And then, obviously, he beat Colton Schultz, who is a national finalist. And this is how I look at if you should pull a true freshman's redshirt. Are they ready to land on the All-American podium? Because if, you're, if you don't All-American at the national tournament, you really don't score that many team points for your team. Guys that lose in the blood round only score two team points. And so if they're not ready to be an All-American, they're not going to help your team that much at the national tournament. Now, they could help you in the conference championship tournament, and that matters. But in this situation, I think it makes sense to lean towards pulling his red shirt. He does look like he's ready to place on the podium. Nothing is guaranteed in the future. You got to take what you can get while you can get it. I think you pull the red shirt and you let him go. That's what I got for you today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, I'm trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. Please like and subscribe and comment. And let's build a community around the sport that we love. And I'll see you in the next video.